kids are all about playtime and adults, we get very, very busy and we don't think about the importance of it. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. So put on the brakes, grab a cup of coffee and join the conversation because it is time for Coffee Breaks with Steve. Talking about a topic today that um, I think is, I think it's important. It's one that I've been reading about recently. It popped up on, I can't remember when it popped up, a while back. It popped up on something that I was looking at. And it, it was about why having a playtime, having not, I mean, we go well as, you know, I play. I, I'm on my computer. Um, <laughs> I'm. Uh, and I play games on my computer, or I I get exercise. Exercise is great, and part of what this is about is, in fact, getting outdoors, uh, getting away from the normal environment for a period of time, and and utilizing our bodies, our systems, to play. But there is a specific emphasis, and there have been studies that have been done very specifically around playtime, and, and setting aside time to actually play for adults. We know that it's good for kids. Studies have shown that, that there are elements of development, both physical and, and mental and, and emotional, for children that are important to have a playtime. But we don't always recognize that that doesn't stop just because we become adults. And there have been numerous studies done over the years by expert researchers, psychologists, psychiatrists, doctors, to look at the benefits of adults taking time to play and the, the detriments if we are not taking that time. And, and we know that that has become, you know, we get busier and busier. We spend more time sitting in front of our computers. It's okay for right now. But when we get done with this today, I expect all of us to go outside and play for a while. But um and then during COVID, we went through this sort of lockdown. And a lot of us, depending on where we lived and what was around us, didn't necessarily even get outside at all or get a whole lot of exercise. Maybe we had some, you know, a, an exercise bike or a treadmill or something in our house that we could use. Or we were going for walks, but avoiding people. And, and playgrounds were shut down. A lot of the places, playgrounds and sports fields and those types of things were shut down. And so even if we were so inclined, we may have gotten out of the habit. So we're going to talk a little bit today about what the experts say, and I've got a couple of sites up, and I'll later on share a couple of these on my Facebook page so that you can go back and find them. But there, there was uh, uh, some information written, and this is from a site called psychcentral.com that talks about why it's is play important for adults. And, and she's going to read a little bit of this. I'm not going to quote everything on here, but it says, researchers say that play is critical for child development. Studies show it's important for adults as well. Playfulness as an adult has many benefits for our well-being and character. And one of the things that it does is it, it boosts overall well-being. There was a study done in 2011 by some Swiss researchers discussing how playfulness in adults is likely linked to certain desirable characteristics. Characteristics. I'll just drink as I go here. Such as liking to make people laugh the ability to ease tension in, in group and social settings, and being able to support creative processes in a group. Researchers ask people to rate themselves on five types of playful behaviors, spontaneity, expressiveness, creativity, fun, and silliness. Sound, you go, really? But we don't see, we don't think about, it's okay to be silly sometimes. It's okay to have fun. It's okay, you know, that we think about spontaneity. Well, some of us don't, are not necessarily keyed in on spontaneity, but so they asked these people to rank themselves in those five areas. They found that higher playfulness scores were associated with higher creativity, appreciating beauty, approaching life with excitement and energy, playful expressions of love, a sense of hope, and a sense of humor. And they, the authors concluded that because of these links, playfulness significantly contributes to overall well-being. Another study done in 2013 has also positively linked play and playfulness with well-being and life satisfaction. Researchers found out that playful adults 
tend to be to do more enjoyable activities and have a more active way of life than less playful adults. Now, if you think about that, I mean, it's like we know this. We already know that certain things, just exercise in general or being exposed to and participating in things that are fun tend to release positive hormones. We Endorphins and other things get, in, get released into our system. And, and those, those hormones and proteins that get released are actually positive for any number of things in our emotional life. They're also helpful in terms of how we cope with certain negativities that come up in life. Anybody on here ever deal with stress or anxiety? I'll raise my hand. Uh, you know, with family coming into town in a wedding this weekend, not surprising at all that we've already dealt with some potentially stressful situations, just a lot going on. I'm officiating the wedding. My wife, Carol, is the coordinator for the wedding. We've been spending time prepping with Sean and Melinda for the last several weeks. And obviously for a bride and groom, the closer you get to the wedding day, the more stress increases, family coming into town, trying to juggle all the things that are going on. Playfulness has also been found to help coping with stress. Spending time doing things that bring joy and pleasure has a relaxing effect that counteracts stress. That same 2013 study that was referred to earlier found that playful adults reported having lower stress levels. Play also helped them use healthier coping styles like acceptance and positive reframing when dealing with stressful situations. Authors found that even though playful and less playful adults were equipped with the same coping skills, playful adults were more likely to use them effectively. So again, you know, as a, listen, we all deal with stress and, and sometimes we're trying to cope with some of these things by met, using medications or self-medicating. And ultimately those things can, can cause more harm than good. I'm not saying that if the doctors prescribe for you some medication to assist with a variety of things, including stress, I'm not saying drop what the doctor's telling you to do, I'm saying let's think about lifestyle changes as well that may contribute to a more positive outcome. The third thing that the, that the Psych Central um, article talks about is that playfulness boosts physical health. Adults who play more have a more active way of life and therefore may be, more, may be physically healthier. The authors of a 2016 study stressed the importance of making physical activity fun for adults. They noticed that children were more likely to be intrinsically motivated to exercise when having fun like jumping and playing in the water. In other words, when exercise feels like play instead of hard work, adults are more likely to engage in it. We've all got things that we like to do, right? I mentioned earlier the idea of playing with kids. And it's some, there's something about the fact kids themselves are so innately keyed into the idea of play that when we join them in playing, we get into their mindset, we get into their space, and we start playing like they do. We become, it's not childishness, it's childlikeness. We become more childlike in our activity level. And think about the uh, the physical attributes of being out there to play. We all know that we need to be exercising anyway. And if we can do it and have fun at the same time, and listen, any exercise that you enjoy doing, continue doing, but being in a playful mode and doing things that are playful and there is something about engaging with other people, I think, makes it more playful, right? That if we're doing things, not to say you can't do things by yourself, you know, hit a tennis ball up against a wall and that type of thing. But when we are engaging with other people socially and in activity, it also boosts that spirit of playfulness that we get into. Um, watching a group of adults playing touch football or kicking around a soccer ball or, or hitting the, even if you're not playing you know, a, a competitive game of tennis, hitting the tennis ball back and forth across the net or trying to. And you know what else happens in that? Do you remember a few weeks ago um, when Leanne Joshua was on here talking about comedy and, and the importance of humor? And she talked about the healthy benefits of laughing out loud. When we're playing and we're playing particularly with other people, we tend to, to do more laughter. There's more laughter that comes through. And all of those things combine. A 2019 study found that playing every day helped people with type 1 diabetes in many different ways, including improved mood, feeling more supported, and sharing more frequently with their partner about how diabetes affected them. All in all, research is, is abundantly clear. 
Playing as an adult has significant benefits for our mental and physical health. So then the question becomes, how can we be more playful? Unlike children, most adults don't have regular playtime built into their schedule. That means that we need to be intentional about play and find ways to incorporate more play into our lives. And there are some tips here that they provide. And I, I kind of want to see, let me see if I can share um, a site. I'm going to tell you about this site, but there is actually, there is a group called, <laughs> you're going to love this, the National Institute for Play. And uh, there is, I'm trying to find the... Um, name of the of the co-founder who's also an author who's written about this it's on the site and let me see if i can find his name real quick i'm gonna again i'm gonna follow up and post a lot of this but uh, his name is is a, he's a doctor by the name of stuart brown and dr brown has has initiated and is a co-founder and part of the ongoing staff and board of the national institute for play but they have done extensive studies on the benefits of play. And one of the things that they have put together is something called the uh, understanding your play personality. And there are different, um, here we go. Dr. Stuart Brown, researcher and founder of the National Institute for Play has identified eight play personalities. I'm just gonna briefly go through these. And again, we'll post this information and the links on, on my site so that you can come back and find them. Um, in fact, you know what I'm gonna do right now? I'm gonna go ahead and put something on the chat and just give me a second here playing around with this that's wonderful using my computer in a positive way okay this is uh this is the national institute for plays website that i think i'm putting on here Let's see if i did that correctly all right and you should be able to go out and find that i'll also i think put the uh the link for the article that I've been referring to here in the chat, and then I'll talk about the play personalities, but I want to make sure you have this information. Once again, I will follow up by putting the information out on the coffee breaks with Steve round table and on my, on my page so that you can find this, but here are the play personalities that they talk about and, and some people that kind of fit into some of these categories. The first one is the collector. Uh, the thrill of play for the collectors to have and to hold an interesting collection of objects or experiences, coins, toy to collectors, they, they, people who collect things. And collectors may enjoy collecting as a solitary activity or maybe the focus of an intense social connection with others who share their passion. Think about kids who like to collect certain types of toys, action figures, uh, cards, trading cards. Did you grow up with like sports trading cards or some other type? I know that my, my son did. And, um, and someone who falls into that category that they point out here is like Jay Leno, who is a car collector. And they talk about that kind of behavior and the people have fun with this. They get excited about it. The second personality is the competitor. Perfect opening gambit, the unbelievable score, the fastest time. Competitors access the euphoria and creativity of play by participating in a competitive game with, with specific rules. We think about people like Tom Brady's of life who are competitors, but some of you on here are competitors too. You like to win at things. We like to play games where we can win. And by the way, it brings up an interesting point about playing and having fun. Our board games, our card games, a part of that. We talked about that a little bit, again, with, with Lee, Lee and Joshua a few weeks ago in, in talking about how when we engage with other people, even in, in games around a table, it, it drums up some of those same things, the laughter, the engagement, the, the release of certain positive chemicals and hormones in our body. I think there's a good combination, and this is me speaking, not as an expert, but just as a person, that I think the combination of outdoor activities and doing things that actually get us moving, exercise type of activities, and engagement in social activities that are, and there's probably even some benefit for people who do online video games with other people for a period of time. But that shouldn't be the only thing. Uh, the third type of personality is the creator artist. For the creator artist, joy is found in making things, painting, printmaking, woodworking, pottery, sculpture, 
are well-known activities of creator artists, but also things like furniture making, knitting, sewing, gardening. Uh, creator artists may show their creations to the world or may never show anyone what they make. The point is to make something. And so you think about people like, and they point out here, Steve Jobs as an example. You could probably think of many other examples. Michelangelo said he could look at a block of marble and see the statue in it, the creator. Then there's the director. Directors play by planning. See, sometimes we think, well, I'm not really very playful, I, but I do like to plan things. I do get excited about putting together an idea and working on an event, that type of thing. A friend, my friend Didi Kiso, who has been on this show before, is, is a definitely a director. She is an event planner and coordinator extraordinaire. When I was working in the nonprofit world, I could do events. I had to put together events. It was not my thing. I did not have fun putting together an event. For me, it was stressful. But for somebody like Dee Dee, she loved all the things that go into that. And if there were things at the last minute that needed to be rearranged or something wasn't coming together, that actually got her juices flowing, she would say, and, and caused her to want to even do more. Directors enjoy planning and executing scenes and events. Though, though many are unconscious of their motives and style of operating, they love the power to make things happen. Now, I guess even though I don't like to put together events, I do this. I enjoy putting coffee breaks with Steve together on a weekly basis, planning ahead for it. So that combination of planner and director is probably part of my play personality. They use the example on the site here of Oprah, Oprah Winfrey, as, as an example of a director. Then there is the explorer as another type of play personality. All of us start life driven to explore our world. Some people never lose their enthusiasm for it. Exploring can be physical, literally going to new places, or it can be emotional, searching for a new feeling or deepening of the familiar through music, movement, even flirtation. It's interesting you threw that in there. It obviously comes from the study, so take that for what it's worth. Uh, exploration can also be mental, such as researching a new subject or seeking out new points of view. Do you find yourself already identifying with more than one of these personalities? That's typical as well. And that's why we can do different things that enter into that mode of play. Uh, they use the, the example of Dr. Jonas Salk um, as an example of the explorer. People, researchers who, who love to look into things. My wife, Carol, one of her favorite activities over these past several years and still now is researching her family's ancestry. And, and, and she has made tremendous progress doing it, but she just enjoys digging into that. So as an explorer. Then there is the Joker. The most basic and extreme player throughout history is the Joker. A Joker's play always revolves around some kind of foolishness. In school, a Joker might have found social acceptance by clowning around to make classmates laugh. Any of you were or tried to be the class clown? Adult Jokers carry on that social strategy in different ways. Um, so talking about the actor George Clooney as a notorious practical Joker with people, they talk about comedians like Jerry Seinfeld and others who get joy and share joy through being funny and, and foolish. Um, now, I'm probably not going to pronounce this correctly, but this one is, this personality is the kinesthete, the kinesthete. Kinesthetes are people, and that's spelled K-I-N-E-S-T-H-E-T-E, -E -E, kinesthete. So if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, you get the idea. Kinesthetes are people who like to move. Some even need to move in order to think. Is that, do you fit, fit into that category? This category includes athletes such as Serena Williams and Steph Curry, but also people like Jillian Lynn who find themselves happiest moving as part of dance, swimming, or walking. Uh, several months ago, we had a lady by the name of Chrissy Whitehead on this show, who is an actor, uh, Broadway, former Broadway television movie actor, who now along with her business partner, has a studio in New York City in Manhattan where they help artists get more comfortable with their acting, their singing, their dancing. And Chrissy is a, is a choreographer by trade, among other things, also a director. She just choreographed a, a production last week of the musical Rent at a college in New York. And so, you know, this kinesthetic, and she herself talks about how getting out there and moving it helps her, helps her to feel good about herself, helps her to think. So, you know, choreographers, dancers, um, th these are people who movement is important. Athletes, 
as part of play. And by the way, even if you're not an athlete, movement is, is going to, you're going to find it to be salubrious. You're going to find it to be a positive. You're going to find it to be beneficial moving in any way. And especially if you can make it fun, as we've already talked about. The next one is the storyteller. For the storyteller, imagination is the key to the joys of play. I am a storyteller, by the way. Storytellers may be novelists, playwrights, cartoonists, or screenwriters, or they may find their greatest joy in reading the novels and watching the movies created by others. I've been multiple guests on Coffee Breaks with Steve, who are storytellers. Last week, Eve Schaub, not only did she put together a book with the, the Year of No Garbage that was very informative, she's telling a story through it about her family, about herself, and it's great reading. If you haven't already followed up on that, please get, get her book. Uh, but they talk about people like Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Garrison Keillor, Bob Costas, natural born storytellers. So those are the eight personalities that uh, are talked about in the by the uh, National Institute for Play. And again, we will put this information uh, in, in in online so that you can go and find this information, find out where you can read more about it. But I would like to know from you, and I see some of you are putting this, do you see something in any of those personalities, one or more of those that feel like they fit you in some way? What do you like to do to play? What do you feel you could be doing? What was something that maybe you enjoyed in the past and you just kind of, you got too busy for? Yes, I understand that as we get older, physicality becomes an issue. We can't always do the things that we used to. And some people are further restricted because of health issues, because of certain disabilities. That doesn't mean that play is gone or off the table. We can still find ways to do that. I love watching uh, Special Olympics. I love watching sports. I've seen sports where there are people who play soccer entirely or basketball entirely in their wheelchairs that they use. Um, it's, it, I'm not saying that everybody who is dealing with some form of, of physical limitation has to do exactly the same things. That doesn't mean that you have to be getting a wheelchair onto a basketball court or that you need to be doing something of that nature. But we can all use our imaginations probably a little bit more effectively than we do, our creativity a little more effectively. And if you want to kick around ideas, I think that's a place we can use the Coffee Breaks with Steve Roundtable. Or we can just, I'd be glad to just brainstorm with you because I could use more playtime in my life. I'm not immune from the same things that we're talking about here today that we all need to be doing better. As an adult, I have gotten into the mode of more sitting down in front of my computer and, and but again, remember, researching, exploring. There are things that we can integrate in. I would just caution personally not to let doing research on a computer because you're naturally an explorer become an excuse not to be engaging in other types of play. I, I just, I want to advocate right now that we all need to be getting out there and doing more. Some of you are, are typically like to go for, you like to go for walks and you, maybe you live in areas, and I know some of you do, where walking is not just walking down the street, it's more of a wilderness experience. And, and some of you like to combine doing that with things like mushroom gathering or, or bird watching or other activities. Those are all positive things that we can engage in. I would also, and, it's not a but, this is an and, and I would say, think about things that you may not already be doing, but are sort of on your list of things that you would like to be doing more of. In fact, maybe that's a little homework assignment we can all take part in doing this next week is saying, what are some activities that I used to do that I'd love to get back to? Make a list of the stuff you're already doing. Applaud yourself for what you may already be doing that's playful. But I also would just say, if you have access through your kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, neighbors, to engage with a child, because they, they are so already tied into that idea, locked into that idea of play as an important thing, join them, learn from them. We can all learn from a little bit from kids, be reminded what that felt like and what that is supposed to be like. I hope this has been, um, I hope this has been something positive for you. I know I went through some research and details here, and, and that can sometimes feel a little bit tedious. But what we're really talking about is breaking through the tediousness of life, bre breaking through the busyness of life. So I, I hope that that is um, play a serious work of children. I love that quote. I think that is a, a perfect, uh, perfect quote. And then I see Kathy, Kathy Garlick put on it here. Um, 
I teach music. Yeah, there we go. I teach music to children. A lot of play involved there. You know, that again comes into several of those personalities coming into focus there, Kathy. And that was always something, even growing up, I give a lot of credit to my, that's Kathy, that was Kathy Garlic that was just highlighted on there's my older sister. And when I say older sister, it's not she's old. It's just she was ahead of me enough as we were growing up that her, we were all playful. But Kathy's level of creativity often fit into putting together ideas around an actual like a play or, or music. She was great at rewriting lyrics to songs. We would spend a lot of time singing songs either with the LPs on our record player, with the radio, or just making up our own words. And that was often led by my sister, Kathy. It's extremely creative. And now she's able to utilize that as a music teacher. And uh, yeah, I think just that engagement with kids on a regular basis, how can you not become a little more playful in order to engage with them or to keep their attention? You have to be able to do that. So that's definitely true. What are your forms of play? What are the forms of play that you want to get back to? What are the forms of play that, that you think, you know, I should probably try. Could you? And the bottom, the bottom line is, if you want to get out there and throw a baseball or kick a soccer ball, it doesn't mean we have to be running full speed. You know, as we get older, maybe our stamina, our physicality does limit certain things. It doesn't necessarily prevent. And we can take things at the proper pace and still be playing and still be having fun and still be laughing and still be engaging in things. So enough said about that. I want to hear from you. I want to hear in the chat here. I want to... Um, put see some stuff as we get on to the round table. We'll talk about that round table in a minute, but let's talk about some things that are coming up in the next few weeks before we finish up today and let you get on with your weekend. Next week, we're going to play a little game. It's going to be interactive. Shalan is going to join me again. Shalan has been um, a, a guest co host and a guest on here on more than one occasion. And we have a lot of fun when we get together. I have a lot of fun whenever I get together with any of my kids. And the fact that they're all here this weekend is just great. But Shalane's going to join me next week. And we're going to play a little interactive game. And you get to play. You get to play with us. And so it's going to be designed in such a way that you can interact in the chat. And what we're going to do is this. There are so many quotes out there that we hear or we repeat or we utilize in whatever setting on a regular basis. Quotes are a big part of how we interact with people at times. Is Well, do you remember what... Benjamin Franklin once said, or, you know, as, as so-and-so said, or we just quote a line from a movie, or we quote a line from a Shakespeare play, or we quote a line from history to use to make a point. Very often, we're misquoting, and we don't know it because it's just been repeated wrong over the years, or we don't attribute it to the correct source, or we don't have it in the proper context. And so we think it means one thing, but it may mean something else. So we're gonna play, we're gonna make it fun. We're gonna play a little game around the things that we think we're quoting correctly. And we're not, and we're gonna see how we do with that. And then in two weeks, let's be friends. Uh, we recorded this conversation a few weeks ago when Carol and I were visiting our dear friends, Scott and Jody Platt in Portland area. And Carol and Jody have been very, very dear friends, best friends for years. And so we took some time to talk about what, it, what friendship is really all about, what it means to be best friends, how we find and retain um, those friendships over a period of time and, and how we continue to nurture them over time. And so we're, uh, we're going to show that uh, conversation with Carol and Jody in a couple of weeks and talk about friendship. I think you'll enjoy it. They're fun when they get together. And this is just a good conversation to have. And then uh, it shouldn't say next week. That should actually say in three weeks uh, on uh, on coffee breaks. It's actually going to be June 10th. So disregard the next week part. But Alexis Cara is, a, is an actor. She's been on Broadway. She's worked in Hollywood, uh, in, in television and movies. And she's doing a lot beyond that now. And so Alexis is actually going to join us to talk about what, what it means, what it feels like, and, and what the realities are of show business success and what life is like beyond the cameras and the, and the stage lights. And then in four weeks, it's going to be Father's Day weekend. And we're going to be sharing a dad story. And it's going to be very personal for me because I'm going to be talking about my dad's story. And it's one, and I'm going to probably reach out to my um, I will reach out to my siblings, several of whom are on here today, 
And we're going to talk about, I want to get some ideas from them to make sure I'm covering the right things. But my dad's story, we all have stories. Our parents all have stories. But I want to share from the perspective of what I know about my dad. And his story is amazing. It's a story of survival uh, as a child, as a teenager, even as an adult, of, of resilience, of perseverance, and of what, for us, for the kids in my family, for my siblings and myself, what it meant to have a dad like him. And so it's going to be a very personal and heartfelt story. And I, and I hope that you will join and enjoy that. Are there topics that you would like us to see us discuss on Coffee Breaks? Are there uh, guests that you would like to see on here? We, we've had some amazing guests on Coffee Breaks. And I'm so grateful for people who have made an introduction, made a referral. I'm grateful for the people I already know who I've reached out to and invited who have agreed to come on here. And I'm, I'm grateful for the people who have been willing to respond when I just reach out to a total stranger and let them know about coffee breaks. But if you've got ideas about things we should be talking about, this is your coffee table. And so I want to make sure that uh, that you are a part of that. So please reach out. The email is right there. Uh, a segment on catnip. Well, moderator Cat's on here today. He hasn't uh, he isn't always in the discussion part of this, but he's here today. So that's nice. All right, listen, I want to once again say thank you to all of you for being here. It is always a pleasure. It is fun for me. It's a playtime for me when I get to be here uh, because I am a storyteller, because I am a, a, have that creative bent. This is fun. And even though we're not all physically sitting around a table together, sipping our cups of coffee or tea or whatever you may have, and here goes mine. Because I haven't had a guest on, I haven't been drinking as frequently, but I love to show off this mug. It's going to mean something very special this afternoon. It does right now. Anyway, I just want to thank you once again for being here. I want to thank you for taking the time to interact because that's part of the fun for me. We are interacting. And listen, if any of you want to get together and play, let's figure it out. I know some of you live in places a little further away than, than what we can do just by uh, walking up the street or something like that. But Love to get together and spend time with, with any of you, but reach out if you want to just kick around ideas about what playtime looks like and share some of your thoughts and some of the things that you do. In the meantime, just want to uh, say I hope you have a great week. Uh, if you're going to a wedding like we are, you're doing something else special this weekend, enjoy. Get out there and, and get outdoors if, uh, if the weather in your situation allows and enjoy some playtime. Whatever you're doing, remember to find a way to make a difference in your world this week. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.